Holy One, you are ever flowing, stirring our hearts and minds to dream with you of all that could be by your grace and power. Stir among us now so that we might hear afresh your wisdom and guidance as scripture is read, that we might be renewed and empowered to dream and to work anew for all your good purposes in creation. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel, or Good News, of Jesus Christ, according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. In this reading, Jesus and his disciples arrive on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, returning to a predominantly Jewish area. Let us listen carefully for God's wisdom and leading. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and we, when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his close cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, God said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the father, child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. So friends, as we turn to reflect on this scripture, please pause for prayer with me. Holy One, who claims us as your beloved, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, as is usually the case with scripture, there is so much that can and should be said about today's scripture. These two interwoven stories have much to teach us. They even challenge us to reflect upon the nature and power of faith in the face of human need as well as Jesus' heart and power in the face of the same. But rather than giving you some long treaties on faith, today I also 
just want us to take some time to think about something a bit more tangible, namely touch, human touch, and its power for healing. While touch has, of course, been used as a tool of healing throughout much of human history, it's only in more recent history that doctors and scientists have begun to have a growing and deeper understanding of the healing power of touch. Did you know that most science, scientific and medical es experts now agree that safe touch eases pain, improves sleep, I'll take that, uh, strengthens the immune system, lessens anxiety, and thus can soften the blows of life, generate hope, and yes, indeed, further healing. I think Jesus knew all this. Long before modern science figured out how to document it or the mechanism by which it happens in our bodies, I think Jesus knew that one of the most powerful ways to convey healing and wholeness is through the simple but sacred gift of touch. We see this, of course, in both of the stories we read today. First, there is Jairus, who comes to Jesus with an urgent plea for his daughter is at the point of death. Jairus comes and falls humbly at Jesus' feet, begging Jesus to come and put his hands on his little girl so that she might be healed and live. Jairus pleads for healing touch. And no doubt, moved by compassion, Jesus does exactly what Jairus asks of him. Jairus, Jesus, and all who were with him set off immediately. And though they are delayed, as we'll discuss in a minute, when they arrive at Jairus' home, Jesus, Jairus, and a select few with them go in to where the girl is laying, now thought by all to be dead. And there, Jesus reaches out and takes the girl by the hand, he then instructs her to get up, and she does. Through touch flows sacred healing and wholeness. In the story of Jesus' encounter with the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, we witness the same. In the midst of the dense crowd on the way to Jairus' house, this bold woman weaves her way through the sea of people so she can come up behind Jesus. For she, like Jairus, believes that Jesus can convey healing and wholeness through a simple touch. So she reaches out to touch his clothes, and as her hand grasps, brushes his cloak, the healing is instantaneous. The bleeding stops immediately. Through touch flows sacred healing and wholeness. For both Jairus' daughter and for this woman, holy power to nurture healing and wholeness flows through touch. It's a simple, bold truth, one that I dare say we all know deep in our spirits but can easily forget. Thus, it is also a holy reminder to all of us that those safe touches, those moments when a hug or an arm on the shoulder or a pat on the back are received with openness, all those safe touches should not be taken for granted in any way. For we never know when one such safe touch might be the very thing needed to let God's healing and wholeness flow. And what's more, in a world which creates all sorts of challenges for those seeking care to aid their healing and wholeness, these stories taken together remind us that God's divine power to nurture healing and wholeness is not reserved for some, but meant for all. For Jairus, 
and this unnamed woman are about as far apart on the spectrum of social standing and privilege as you can get. First, of course, there's Jairus, who we're told explicitly is a leader of one of the area synagogues. Perhaps imagine him as the synagogue president, if you will. And as such, he is a Jewish man of power and privilege in a predominantly Jewish region. By contrast, Mark leaves the woman unnamed, perhaps to highlight her status as a social outcast. For in first century Galilee, her bleeding would have made her ritually unclean, which is very different than sinful, yet still meant that she was prohibited from physical contact and by practicality, really any contact with others. Moreover, Mark tells us that she has spent all she had in her efforts to get well. So she's not just a social outcast, she is a social outcast without any resources or connections. The differences and the disparities between Jairus and this unnamed woman are great, but one is not deemed worthy, more worthy than the other. One is not given care while the other is denied. No. Through the holy gift of caring touch, God's divine power to nurture healing and wholeness flows forth from Jesus freely for both of them and beloved people of God also for us and for all of creation still today. And actually, I would guess that most of us gathered here this morning can recall a moment in our lives when we have already experienced God's divine power flowing through, God's divine power for healing and wholeness flowing to us through a simple caring touch. Perhaps it was something like this. Perhaps it was that parent's patient hand cleaning, bandaging, and kissing that first scraped knee when you were learning to ride your bike. Or maybe it was that coworker's truly welcoming handshake and smile on your first very anxious day at a new job. Or maybe it was that loved one's arm over your shoulder while you waited to hear the results of that important exam or test. Or maybe it was a hug from a friend just after you learned of the loss of a loved one. Or maybe, maybe it was that friend or family member or caregiver who stopped each day to squeeze, to hold the hand of a dear someone who lay in a hospital bed or a nursing home, only able to communicate through the gift of touch. All these and more are ways that God's power to nurture healing and wholeness is still flowing forth in the world through safe, caring touch. And so today, we simply pause to remember and give thanks And to remind ourselves that part of our call as followers of Christ is to be conduits of God's healing power as Christ was. We are called to let God's power to nurture healing and wholeness not only flow into us when we need it most, but also flow through us whenever we encounter any who are in need. And sometimes that's even done a bit by proxy, as we paint some stones and pass them along, passing on a touch of love and caring. Friends, God's power to nurture healing and wholeness is meant for us and is meant for all. And just as Jesus shared the power to heal through a simple touch, so can we. And so in faith, in hope, may we do so today and every day. Thanks be to God for God's gift of touch and for healing. 
And let all God's people say, Amen.